Tesla stock jumped twice in the last several weeks, once right after the earnings call and again right after Elon visited China to get preliminary approval for full self-driving. Who did the buying? There are good signs that institutional investors and a short squeeze are the main drivers. Today, we'll review what Jim Cramer, Dan Ives of Wedbush Securities, Adam Jonas of Morgan Stanley, and Tom Narayan of RBC Capital are saying. It's great to finally see the institutional investors turning around and recognizing the value of the coming robo-taxi future. I've got Hans Nelson joining us, and Hans has his own YouTube channel called Hans C. Nelson. Welcome, Hans. Thanks for having me, Herbert. So one of the uh, videos you wanted me to play was in the All In podcast. You have Jason Kalkanis and Shamat. Uh, let's listen to what they said about Tesla and specifically about different investors, right? So they refer to a sharp and a square. And you've told me that a sharp investor is somebody who is an expert, right? They know what they're doing. And versus a square is somebody who just kind of dabbles in investing, right? So it's yeah, it definitely has a lot to do with the experience and, um, and the ability to read, have a better quality read on the underlying environment and the the opportunities that are in front of us and let's listen to what they said about tesla's stock and investors back in the day your thoughts on tesla in 2024 sharps love it this is another one sharps versus the squares why did the sharps love it why did it go up and everybody was so confused and i think the answer is that he's actually executing exactly to plan and so if you're investing in a stock what you really want is a ceo to kind of stick to a plan that is well known. So we don't have to actually guess what the plan is because he puts it out on the website. Look at the yeah. master plan part two. And if you start reading down, everything that he said he's gonna do starting in 2016 is basically what it is. So let's take the first part, right? What did he say in the first part? He said, hey, listen guys, this is 2016. We're gonna build a Model 3. We're gonna build a compact SUV, the Model Y. We're gonna build a new kind of pickup truck. Okay, check, check, and check. Then he said, oh, by the way, we're also probably going to have to do a heavy duty truck and a high passenger density urban transport vehicle. So that's the robo taxi thing that he's going to announce in August. OK, check and check. And then he talks about the software and the investment in FSD and trying to get to a place where, you know, you can just have a much higher probability that it will save you from an accident and it will keep you safe when you're driving your car, which will be a large driver of why people want to buy the cars themselves. And you can see like these FSD models. So. If you're a smart capital allocator, what you actually saw was a dislocated stock price. What you saw was a plan that by and large, he's been executing on at a strategic level. Underneath, there's the vicissitudes. What are the vicissitudes? Sometimes you overhire, you need to trim some fat. Sometimes you overspend on CapEx. Now he spent about a billion of, of CapEx this quarter on AI infrastructure, so H100s for training. But the market saw through it because that was a reasonable amount of money to spend on training for FSD, right? So you can start to see the tail of these two reactions. The Sharps looked at the capital allocation and said, okay, you missed by two and a half billion this quarter, but that's going to create a buying opportunity because we think it's roughly mispriced. And we think it's mispriced because going back to this plan from 2016, this is all the things that we've been underwriting from $40 billion of market cap to 750, and now we're getting a 40% discount to buy back in. So I think it's a really interesting moment to just contrast and compare what Sharps look at and then what the media breathlessly exaggerates. Hmm. And I think what they wanted was to lionize the, the meta earning story, but the Sharps rejected it, and they wanted to dump on Elon and the Sharps rejected that in size in both cases. And it's just a reminder to all of us, be very careful what you're reading. <laughs> okay. I love it. That was a great, great explanation of what's happening. Uh, why don't you um, tell us a little bit more to understand that better? Yeah, I think the thing to really key in on there is that $2.5 billion worth of negative free cash flow in the quarter. And I, you know that's one of the things that everyone who has a short thesis or they are a bear on Tesla wants to latch onto and say that, oh my gosh, this is the beginning of the end. Everything is going to hell in a handbasket. And, you know, if the, if there was a structural reason why that was going to continue to happen, 
and that continuing to have that negative free cash flow was going to lead to smaller earnings over time, then they might have a point. But the thing is that most of that two and a half billion dollars was due to just inventory growing over the quarter because they weren't as able to deliver as many vehicles as they produced thanks to all the supply chain shortage or uh, supply chain disruption things that happened. And so, you know, we should see that corrected next quarter. So the market is saying that one and a half billion dollars worth of negative free cash flow is a one-time deal. It's not going to affect things in the future. In fact, we actually may get a rebound next quarter. Uh, we may actually be able to deliver more uh, vehicles than are produced in the quarter next quarter. And so we could get quite a bit of that back. And then on the flip side, the billion dollars that is CapEx spend right now, if Tesla says they're an AI company and they're not spending a lot of money on purchasing H100s or something that they can use equivalently in-house, then the market's not going to take them seriously as an AI play. And so the fact that they are spending a large amount of money on that AI infrastructure is something that the market is appreciating and they want to see that. Um, and so, you know, I think all of those two pieces put together really help to drive home the point that Chamath is making that the sharp investors that are managing institutional money feel very confident about the future earnings growth and potential of Tesla as a stock. And especially they like to see, okay, hey, when everyone is saying this is the end of the world and the things that everyone is crying about are not reflections that we think are going to be hurtful to the story long term, but actually helpful. That mismatch between perception and reality is a great opportunity for a sharp investor to come in and snatch up shares and make a lot of money in a very short amount of time. And that's what we've already seen just here in the last little week. Sure, sure, sure. But they're they're also the uh, they were also the people that are just lemmings. They follow down. It's the world is falling apart. And now they see it's going up. And so <laughs> I, I think that there's a difference between what the types of sharp investors and you know this is speculation on my part, but that Chamath is talking about are probably people who have just been out of the. They haven't been actively trading Tesla at all for a long time. Like they come in when they see. Um, either if they think things are way overhyped, then they'll come in and they'll do a short, but they're not going to stick with that for a long time. Um, and so these are probably people that maybe the last time they were in the name was back in 2022 when things were really frothy and maybe they had a short position on there and then they're going to get out of it and say, you know, too much volatility. You don't know where this is going until they see, uh, you know, maybe they're going to buy in at a hundred, maybe they're going to buy in at 140. Like these opportunities make a quick turnaround and then get back out. Or if they are the long-term types of people, maybe they sold when they had the the profits. And now that the price is corrected okay. back towards lower levels, maybe yeah. they're buying in for longer term. Yeah, well, it's, it's looking like that institutional investors are new money is flowing in because the volume of mm -hmm. um, these trades every day seems to be very high, much, very unusual. And then you can see here, uh, Joseph uh, shared this, the squeeze for shorts is real. The shorts, many people will be forced to cover their option contracts. The volume is really, really high here. You can see that. And so there is certainly some short uh, uh, that are happening. So let's take a look at uh, the flip-flops that we're seeing now. <laughs> Jim Cramer, so negative. He's just, again, jumping on the bandwagon. I'm only going to play this because it's just one minute long. So it's just fun to hear him say positive things about Tesla. And of course, the date that we're, we're, we're doing this recording, the stock has fallen. <laughs> so he's 100% accurate. When he says something's good, things fall. Welcome to Mad Money. Welcome to Cramerica. Other people make friends. I'm just trying to make a little money. My job is not just to entertain, but to educate and teach you. So call me at 1-800-743-CBC or Damn tweet it. me at Jim Cramer. Apple and Tesla led the market today, Dow gaining 146 points. S&P advancing 0.32%. Now it's not climbing 0.35%. But the averages, frankly, they were almost a sideshow to these two stocks. And each had a very different story to tell. Both incredibly instructive about what can make a stock go higher in this dynamic market. Now, you wouldn't expect the overall market to be this benign coming into the biggest earnings week of the year with a worrisome Fed meeting, worrisome labor report at the end of the week. But the trajectory of these two stocks, both incredibly weak for the year, has nothing to do with the Federal Employment Report anyway. So how did Apple stock rally 2.5 percent? Tesla stock roar 15 percent. What happened? Right, I've been saying that Tesla stock would keep going down unless and until Elon Musk pulled a rabbit out of a hat. He wasn't able to find that rabbit in time for the quarter but he bagged a terrific one 
this weekend when he got permission to sell a subscription-based derivative of full self-driving for the Tesla in China, which gives him a whole new revenue stream, a big one. That can go a long way to restore price momentum after vicious price cutting in China. Just as important as how Musk got it. He made a surprise trip to China, met with uh, Premier Li, and nailed down a deal with Baidu, the Google of China, that allows us to have the best maps available. This is unbelievable. And it's also a perfect example of the CEO redefining the narrative. There have been a feeling that Musk had gotten so, I don't know, they had so much going on that he hadn't been paying attention to Tesla. Now, here he is doing something no American CEO can do. Just get on a plane and make a deal with the leader of a country that our government isn't particularly fond of. I can't think of anything similar in the annals of American business, except maybe went arm and hammer, went to the Soviet Union during the Russian Civil War and became Lenin's chosen capitalist. At the time, there were U.S. troops in Russia fighting against the communists, and this guy still made a fortune negotiating with Lenin. Of course, I don't put Xi Jinping in the same category as Lenin, but he's still much more fr- uh, he's a little more friendly. Ha. But Hammer's the only other executive I can remember who could make a surprise trip to a hostile country and come back with an extremely lucrative deal. That said, it's not a magical elixir for Tesla. It's not full self-driving. Competition remains stiff. But let's face it, no one else can pull this off, which is why shareholders love the guy and bid the stock up so much, making fools of last week's downgraders. Okay, let's pause it there. I can't take enough of him. (laughs) He's an entertainer, is what he told himself. (laughs) Comments on his... (laughs) So I would say that the sentiment that Elon can get deals done abroad Mm -hmm. that no one else can do is right on the money that is true and we've seen Tesla's ability to do that proven out over the years so you know we don't need jim kramer to tell us what we already know on that front that said um yeah i think that i'm very uh pessimistic about whatever jim is yeah. excited about at the moment he seems to follow you know the and there, there's a structural reason for this that maybe it doesn't have anything to do with anything more going on to it maybe there is more but uh the thing that sells more tv time is talking about the thing that everyone cares about right now what does everyone yeah. care about right now yeah, yeah. it's whatever just happened not what's about to happen it's whatever just happened that's that's where you can get the eyeballs and so he's in the business of trying to comment on what has already happened after the fact not really helping people to understand what's going to happen in the future let's let's listen to dan ives he's much more somebody that i follow quite closely uh he's been pretty negative about tesla just recently he's a major tesla bull but he's been saying that um you know elon better communicate better and he got it right because uh, I think that many of us agreed that he needs to communicate better, and he did that in the earnings call. And he, you know, uh, Dan is very colorful. His language is fantastic. This is a watershed moment. Let's watch a little bit of what um, what he's saying here. I think it makes complete sense because look, Josh, this is a watershed moment for Musk to get FSD in China. It's a game changer. This is something years in the making. No investor thought this was going to happen for the next year. He gets back on that plane from Beijing, drinking mimosas. This was a trophy case win. Dan, why, though? Because all of the other electric vehicle makers that are already competing with Tesla in China, they already have autonomous driving capabilities that have already (laughs) existed. There's been, of course, price wars going on in China and stiff competition from those other electric vehicle makers. If I'm a, a Chinese consumer and I'm thinking about buying a car, is FSD really the thing that's going to be push, pushing me over the edge to buy a Tesla versus a BYD or another car? Yeah, it's a great question, Julie. I'd say there's two reasons why this is so important. One, FSD, the autonomous vision, number one, in our opinion, being Tesla over the coming years, they needed China. In, in terms of just from a data perspective, when you think from an AI angle what they're doing they needed china but we so don't know if they the can use audience. but sorry to interrupt him we don't know if they can actually how they can use that data right well yet but ultimately if you look what must been able to do remember years ago they said he'd never be able to build a factory in china now look at giga the point is they need tesla as much as tesla needs china because it's the trophy case. You look at Apple, you look at Tesla, two of the best brands in the world. That's why they allowed this with Baidu as a partner. 
And the reason it's so important is that Tesla almost had one hand behind its back not having FSD in China. Now they have that. And I believe what's starting to get factored in here is a demand. I'm not saying the next week or two, a demand recovery in China. But betting against Musk, it's like betting against Brunson in the playoffs. And Dan, ultimately, it seems like, you know, if you're a Tesla bull, it, it, are you excited because you ultimately think, listen, this potentially, you know, the impact this has on subscription fees, on maybe even licensing in this software to OEMs, is it really, is it a margin story, Dan? Yeah, John, I think two things. One, in when you look at Tesla China, it expands the TAM. What they're going to be able to do there from autonomous, not just about the next six, 12 months, especially with Baidu, where does this go over the next three, five years? I mean, when you think about robo taxis and the autonomous vision. Two, this shows you, you're really starting to see Musk and China, that relationship get tighter and tighter. And that's a great thing for the stock. That's important because as we all know that's been the biggest overhang year. And that's why right now the bears on Tesla, which so far have won this year, they're going back into those hibernation, uh, you know, into the caves. Yeah. Let's pause it there. Yeah. What is your thought? So there's Everybody has a it. couple yeah. of really important points to yeah, key in on there. One of them is going to be the fact that I think a lot of the depression in Tesla stock price, just like Dan mentioned, over the past 12 to 24 months, has actually centered on this narrative that all these Chinese competitors are going to take mm -hmm. away Tesla's ability right. to sell cars in China. And I think this is definitely a strong counterpoint to that, that, you know, the fact that we're going to have this software able to operate there now means that you know we can offer our own version of a software package that's you know it's going to be much more than competitive with anything that is homegrown right there right now um <clears throat> but you know there's capability that maybe was not very great capability but that these other companies had that tesla wasn't able to offer anything similar to and now they will that's a positive thing and tesla's demand has held up pretty well in the face of that um, but then the other thing is that the thing that Tesla has that none of these Chinese competitors have is that brand value that, you know, people in China look at Tesla like they look at Apple. And so now to be able to have the software to offer that really helps to cement that is is really positive. The other thing that I would say domestically here in the United States that this really should make clear to everyone is that Waymo is never going to have self-driving cars in China. It's never going to happen. And so for people that say that Waymo is ahead of Tesla in the race to robo-taxis, now you have to take into account, wait a second, why is it that Tesla is going to be able to operate their robo-taxi fleet potentially not only here in the United States, but also in China? Who else can do that? Oh, no one. Because we're not going to allow, you know, Xiaomi or BYD or Neo Robo Taxis to operate here in the United States. It's only going to be Tesla that's going to be able to operate in both the US market and the Chinese market more than likely. It's certainly the only one that looks like it's in a position to do that right now. And I think that also changes the way that smart people think about what the future of this market's going to play out to look like. Yeah. So the, um, yeah, the comment about uh, there's lots of other competitors out there. Um, you and I have covered this several times. I've just been repeating it over and over, but I don't have the chart with me right now. But there are a number of Chinese car companies and others that are doing, you know, kind of doing autonomy. They have two issues, though, right? None of them currently today, uh, almost all of them are doing LiDAR. costs $150,000 to fit a car yep. and all the costs to map, HD map an entire location. And then they not doing neural nets yet. Only two companies have made, um, you know, moves in the last year to, to go neural net. That is Li Auto and Huawei, the only two Chinese car companies that are behind. The rest are not. And so, yes, they can kind of show you that I can do robo taxi, but it's not in any way uh, as, 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 you know, as, as advanced. It's not going to compete at scale. Yeah. yeah. You know, they'll be able to offer it in a few places, uh, but they're not going to be able to operate in a general way. 
um, I think uh, James Dalma pointed out that using Uber data, right? That uh, in the city of Chicago, you need 100,000 cars. Are you going to get 100,000 times 150000 $150, per car to mm -hmm. fit it with LiDAR. Yep. Just not going to do it. And then there's so, going to be, you know, there's a lot of cities in China that are way bigger than Chicago that are going to need way more taxis than that. So yeah, yeah it, it's it's tough. Okay. So just, uh, so here's, he, you got uh, Morgan Stanley, Adam Jonas. I'm not going to read the whole point, but he, his position is that he saw it as Elon's back. Elon's visit to China means far more than seeking approval for self-driving tech on Chinese roads. Whether Tesla CEO sleeping on a floor or in a plane, the message is clear: he's back. Um, a lot of people, when I said when I when I posted this up, they said, "What do you mean he's back? He's always been there." But on the other hand, you know, if he's actually uh, there to you know comes takes a look and goes, "Hey, we're we're we need to be cutting costs. We need to be getting rid of redundancies," and he's finding that well, then why did that even happen if he was? you know, focus really clearly on the company. What's your thinking about that? Is he back? I mean, honestly, I think it's probably kind of both. I think that part of where we are today is just that this is the natural season that you have to be getting more yeah. serious about the things that are moving forward because there was up until the last six months, I think there was a lot of uncertainty about how, what is the timeline to full self-driving look like? that until we got to the point where we are no longer compute constrained and Elon, like I think the reason for Elon's renewed focus on a lot of the projects going on at Tesla is because he now has certainty about what the timeline for FSD is going to look like that he didn't have 12 months ago. So I think it really has more to do with that than you know necessarily that he was distracted. But I think it is fair to say that he was not as engaged in making things happen at Tesla as he is right now. And, and like I said, I'm, I'm going to assign that more to the fact that we've got clarity around yeah. FSD timelines than it has anything to do with distractions. That now that we know, okay, the future, we've, we've got a solid plan of when things are going to happen. Now we can make concrete moves to bring that timeline in as quickly as possible. We can think about how we need to spend CapEx in the most efficient way. And now that we're really moving forward rapidly on all those things, now is the time when we have to get serious about our organizational structure and trimming the fad and doing all those things. Um, and so that's the analysis that I would put on that. I you know, it. lots mm -hmm. of people are going to disagree with me, um, but I've been following the company a long time. I, I would say that I probably understand it as well as a Dan Ives might. So yeah, absolutely. And I agree with you. I love that uh, point. You know, the focus now is that uh, we're going to focus on robotaxi and AI and bots. We're going to reinvest the money that we're spending in, uh, overhead and, and to that. And then, now, like you said, now that he has a clearer vision of what's happening and how to make robotaxi succeed, he's willing to now make decisions on, you know, the, the next gen car and the, the models that they're going to release that are lower cost and so forth. So big changes need to happen. And I'm very glad that he's back <laughs> or he's, let's not say that he's back, but that he's a wartime CEO again, hard decisions yeah. being made, but we know that Elon, I, you know, that's why we, we bet on this company it's because he makes the right calls. This is Tom Narayan of RBC Capital. He's been a very bullish uh, on Tesla as well. He gave an outperform rating, a 293 price target on Tesla. And he said, what do you, th what, what do we think? Winning FSD in China would be significant. It would unlock a significant fleet of Tesla vehicles able to charge subscription fees. This is central to our investment thesis on the stock, and we do include some Tesla FSD capture in China. Importantly, while initially we envisioned several level two players, it pushes Tesla further to be the industry standard for software. We also envision a scenario where, where regulators mandate level two as a life-saving tool. I've been talking about that for a while. Less Tesla FSD is five times safer than the U.S. fleet, according to the U.S. accidental data accident data provided by the company. In the same way seatbelts and airbags were mandated on vehicles, we could see level two offerings. And I think just uh, just yesterday, right, NHTSA announced that by 2029, they're going to mandate um, a, uh, AED, right, uh, automatic emergency braking, AEB, that all cars must have that. Another benefit could be increasing the chance for Tesla to license software to OEMs. This is a small part of our thesis, however, it remains a call option. One's concern we have heard voiced from investors whether Chinese companies could pirate the software, FSC is more than software, it includes millions of driving data, da-da-da-da. Yep. So, 
you know that this is yeah. the thing right yeah i, I just sorry it's, it bothers me when i hear analysts say um you know it's going to become a commodity there are competitors yeah other people are going to do this because yeah they might be two years behind but it's just software i've never seen yeah. uh yep. another software not be copied you know what future. else is just software google search algorithm i was going to say that it's like it is but it, it truly that one truly is except that because they got the, the data advantage they are just always better at delivering you the right thing not just copying the algorithm and connecting pages yep. the right pages to show you they know you so well and that's the same thing with this it's a data advantage th that comes to play but um yeah that's a yeah. good point exactly i was going to say that i mean it, that truly is copyable there are many many search engines out there thousands and um but there's only one it's that, almost like network well, effects are actually a thing <laughs> <laughs> yeah there you go uh, so, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing all of these, um, a lot of them and not all, but of course, so many of these institutional analysts, we, we think that the money's flowing in. It is an inflection point for the company. Um, I love, so on, on Tom's point, the fact that other people are thinking about, you know, there are lots of ways for Tesla to monetize the, so like the, the core thesis is that full self-driving software is very valuable and that Tesla will be able to monetize it. And obviously the way that Elon works is he's always going to talk about how do we pursue the most ambitious, craziest goal that makes mm -hmm. the biggest change for all of our goals. And, you know, full robo taxi fleets always going to be the goal along the way. There are a lot of intermediate steps that we know that at the very least we as investors can put a floor on Tesla's future potential earnings by saying, like just making reasonable assumptions about, you know, if we don't make it all the way to robo taxis, but all we have is the best level two software in the industry that's the cheapest for other people to install in their cars. That's a pretty big way to make money and make the road safer at the same time. Seems like a no brainer. And if that's all that Tesla's able to accomplish, it's an incredible investment thesis all by itself. And that's only 10, 20, 30% of the overall market that Tesla is pursuing. And so it kind of gives you a, a way that you can come back and set some floors and say, okay, you know, this is best case scenario, this is medium, and then this is the bear case scenario. And when your bear case scenario is that, oh, we're only going to be able to license level two software to like a ton of people, mm. man, I, I don't know if that's a company that I want to be invested in anymore. <laughs> sure. You know, and then it's kind of uh, coincidental, maybe maybe not that the margins, you know, Tesla makes what seven or $8,000 per car. But if you want to buy FSD, that's $8,000 one time, or you know, not hundred dollars, $99 per month. That's a thousand two hundred per year. So five years from now, you've got seven, six to $7,000, yep. right? So it's, uh, and that's, the margins. that's with the software being in the worst state that it's going to be for the next 20, 30, 40 well, years. So like it's I've only getting better this. from here. Few people have been agreeing with me, and I'm sure they're going to change their mind soon. I keep saying that just FSD improving over time, it's alone going to be able to increase the sales of Model 3, Model Y, even if Tesla does not release, well, of course they are, a lower compact car. And I get that, yes, people want to buy, it's about price. Uh, I get that part. But I'm just saying that, you know, in the meantime, while we're waiting, the Model 3 Model Y could increase in sales just because the people are starting to realize yep. that it's robotaxi ready, that it's FSD ready, level two ready, safer than anyone else. So it could go past what it's maximum that people think it could be. Um, thank you so much, Hans. Follow him on his YouTube channel. Check him out there. That's uh, Hans C. Nelson. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. I've created a website that is the most comprehensive resource for the Tesla investor. Please check it out. Simply go to my website at herbertong.com.